Okay, we're back. We're live. One o'clock rock. I'm Jay Fidel here on ThinkTech and more specifically on research in Manoa and our ongoing inquiry into the mm, all the things in the universe. We don't limit our inquiry. Uh, we have with us uh, Jeff Taylor, researcher, Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology in SOAS, the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology at the University of Hawaii Manoa. And we have Linda Martell, academic academic support in the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planet Planetology. Thank okay. you again for being here, you guys. Nice Always to be here. good to be here. Mm -hmm. Mainstays to teach us and make <coughs> us curious about the universe. And, and today's show is uh, the origin of the Earth and um, the Moon, comma, inseparable. Wow, that's provocative. We need to know about that. Who wants to start? We're going to talk about some of the older theories that people had about the origin of the moon because we've seen that moon up in the sky ever you know ever since mankind's been looking up there so how did it get there and then we're going to talk about uh, a breakthrough in the 1980s that, that kind of changed a lot of drastically thinking drastically changed the way we're looking interesting at it. yeah and how, how the come theories we were not advised of this earlier <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you didn't ask <laughs> Okay. So today, people are still thinking about these theories and coming up with ways to test them. So, so we'll, start we'll from get the into a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. But this whole idea of inseparable, you know, has been since the space age, these pictures of the Earth and Moon. In Apollo, it was beautiful pictures of the Moon in the foreground and Earth in the background. Mm -hmm. And then satellites going out of the planet started taking pictures of the Earth and Moon from a distance. Yeah. And one of the coolest recent one taken, it was taken about actually 18 months ago, I think. The satellite called, uh, it's a climate, deep space climate explorer. And they have a camera on it that has an acronym, but the acronym spells out EPIC. EPIC, really, perfect, that, perfect, What a great perfect. name. <laughs> and so it, it's, settled, it's a million miles from, from Earth, uh, this satellite. And it's in a place where the, all the gravity balances that we call them Lagrange points. And they... Uh, so that it's easy to aim it and keep it aimed at the Earth. And it just looks at the Earth and takes a picture every couple of hours. And is this further than the moon? Further than the moon, yeah. yeah. How far is the moon? A quarter of a million miles. Okay. And this is well, a million miles. Okay. So it's four times Great further. Great shot then from a, a yes, million Yes, and we have you can see this it. film <laughs> they made of looking at the Earth for a million miles, and the moon goes in front of it and it gets a picture of it but what you get a picture of is the far side of the moon oh, that you oh, don't see from the earth because it's always locked in gravitationally so always the same side looking at the can we see that now i think we could oh, to see the, number, the first slide which Let's is here do. it is yeah. here's the moon creeping in oh wow look at that and that's the, all the far side of the moon dark it's not it's dark but not now otherwise we couldn't see it yeah the dark side of the moon was a great album, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's do it one more time. <laughs> one more time. Can we do that one more time, get some more detail on it? <laughs> and so the moon doesn't always intersect this view of the Earth from this satellite. And so, uh, but it's, it's neat. And the whole idea of the mission is to look at the Earth, just look at it and to try to understand. It has some other sensors on board, but the camera it seems to be so cool. So this is the far side. It looks quite different, you know, not as much of the dark areas that we have on the near side. Uh -huh. Right, we would never see that from We'd the surface here. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but here they are close together. They must have, their formation must have something to do with each other. Yes, huh? they must. Rather than just some accidental thing, you would think. Yes. And certainly, however the moon formed, we think we know, sort of, and but however formed, it must be informative about the very beginnings of the Earth too. Yes, and that's what's so neat about that's it. That's why yes. we call them inseparable. Yes, All right. <laughs> I love this discussion. Yeah, in contrast to like Jay and me, as you would attest to, insufferable, <laughs> completely, yeah, it's completely different. different. It's not exactly <laughs> the same thing. So you know, uh, I mean, the, uh, it's not just logic that makes us believe that the moon and the earth, you know, had a relationship <laughs> or have a relationship. It's got to be science too, right? It's not just logic. What is the science? Well, the science, well, first, let's go through the ideas that we had um, until 1984, literally. 
And so we have, we have three pictures here that we're going to describe. Mm. Just okay. three major theories. They were all in such disfavor that Harold Urey, who was kind of the founder of space chemistry, uh -huh. he said that, well, these theories are all wrong, so the moon mustn't exist. <laughs> there you go. That's a good one. <laughs> so anyway, okay, if, if you could put up the, the second slide. Mm -hmm. Looks like a bowling pin. Oh, it's mine. It's a bowling um, pin. It's a bowling pin. The idea was that the Earth was spinning so fast early on that a blob of it uh, spun off to form the moon. It's perfectly logical for the, something like that to happen. But would there be a time when it was all hot like that and molten like that? Yeah. Uh, it was, in order for this to work, it has to have been that way. And yeah. then the question is, were there data that would say that? And yeah. the moon and Earth both form very early, yeah. and if they form really hot, then that could actually happen. You don't sound convinced. No, no one was convinced about that because it was, you couldn't figure out two things. One was how to get it spinning fast enough for this blob to come flying yeah. off. Mm -hmm. And the second thing was um, how to, it, it, if you get it spinning fast enough, there's too much spin. And you have to get rid of a lot, we call it angular momentum, get rid of the spinning of the Earth, yeah. spinning of the Moon, and spinning of the, in, the, in its orbit. It's too much of it. The Moon would be whipping around the Earth, and you have to get rid of it. Well, it turns out recently someone has figured that out. But uh -huh. nevertheless, the other problem is, uh, it is testable in principle if the Moon and Earth have the same comp chemical composition. Okay. So. Wasn't that, that idea that the, the moon spins off the earth. Wasn't Darwin somehow uh, the son His of Darwin? Son, <laughs> son, or, son or grandson of Charles Darwin had this idea that it spun off, and now he spun off, spun off in, in the Pacific, which is why there's not <laughs> no continents here. That's what the ah, idea the moon was. Came from the earth. Came yeah. from the earth, right specifically from the Pacific. Well, that can't. <laughs> can't possibly be because the seafloor is too young and it, the moon's been there for too long. But that's but the idea the was idea. Was, uh, was very popular, but everyone recognized, even when in discarding that theory, that it had to be early on. Yeah. When the moon's, when, as you pointed out, when the Earth is just molten. Yeah. Well, there's another idea. So okay. that, that's our third picture. Okay, third picture. Well, this is interesting. <laughs> so this is an idea that the Earth is in the middle there, it's still hot, and then uh, the Moon uh, accreted, came together at the same time. They sort of see that ring of rocky stuff, uh -huh. uh, it, it coalesced into a Moon, and so they, they sort of grew up together side by side, but independently. But that doesn't really work as an idea because the Earth has a very large metallic core and the Moon doesn't. So if they, they grew up sort of at the same time from the same building blocks, why didn't they sort of come out the same? Yeah, um, yeah. The other thing is, is, <clears throat> is there a, a, a physical principle about the, that, that belt of space junk out there? Can we see that picture again for a minute? You know, that belt? I mean, is there a, a, a principle in physics that would say, well, if this stuff is spinning around the Earth as it was then, um, that, that it could come together? Yeah. Into, there it, is a principle? That, that works out. And uh, in fact, our new ideas have some elements of that in it. And, um, uh, but it, they do get pulled apart as well. It's like Saturn's rings. It's not mm. one, there's not a, yeah, a yeah. single big moon out there. It's a whole bunch of rings. Mm. And so the, the real problem was this iron problem that people tried to work around, but no, even they were not that enthusiastic about how you have so much more metallic iron in the earth than in the ring of debris. And how the ring gets started was something of a mystery, you know? It, it wasn't clear. Why not just form one planet? Why this yeah. ring? Yeah. You needed oh, another mechanism. Yeah. You also talked about the angular momentum. So it, if these two things just form together, then why do we have this high angular momentum right now between the system with the way that the moon is orbiting us? So it yeah. doesn't quite... It doesn't, it doesn't quite, quite work. It doesn't yeah. work. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so then there was another idea. Okay, wow. This is the next slide. This one is called capture. This, this is an idea that the moon fully formed somewhere else and happened to be in the neighborhood of Earth, and Earth's gravity pulled it in and just got it into orbit around us. And people are thinking that the probability of this is very low, and why didn't this moon just hit the Earth 
like everything, all the other debris. Yeah. Um, so this is. Eddie was going very fast, and it went beyond Earth, and then the gravitational force of Earth came back, pulled it back, and then it wound mm -hmm. up in, in a in a trajectory yeah. of some kind. And if it comes too fast, it just. Keeps going. Keeps it would going. just, or maybe yeah. skip and has keep to be, going. Yeah. Right. yeah. And there were real, just right. there were just exactly, exactly. It has to be a little kind of Goldilocks thing. zone. Yeah, yeah. right. That's yeah. Right. That's what just strikes right. me though is that you don't have a lot of uh, debris floating around the size of the moon. That's a pretty big piece of space junk. You come that's, from nowhere. That's right. Yeah. It doesn't happen very well, much. Well, <laughs> it doesn't happen. On the other hand, the Earth formed by coming together a big piece of the space junk from moon size to even up to oh, okay. bigger and bigger. So this, the psi, it's the rarity of the event of capturing that's mm. so hard yeah. without smashing into the earth. Yeah. That is a more effective way of capturing things. Yeah, yeah. So none of these ideas are working. And where are we now in the timeline? When was this last that, uh, theory advanced? The last, mm. the, oh, oh, these were around for quite a while through the, 60s, uh, and of course Darwin's idea of the spin-off uh, was in the 1800s or something like that, I think. But, but they, they, these were the things discussed up into, there were new ideas in the mid-70s, but the, this was discussed uh, right up into the 80s. And, and in um, 1983, I was on this committee that uh, gave out lunar samples of, of to people who requested them, you know, and uh, made recommendations to NASA on, on the nature of them. But we also ran a series of conferences about the moon, uh, just to to continue the interest in it and make it multidisciplinary, so we'd have good use of the samples. And one day we were we were sitting around, and one of the guys said, a guy named Gunter Lugmeier, who is retired now from UC San Diego, he said, "Is that one on the origin of the moon?" And everyone said, well, that's a good idea. That would seem to be about time. We should just focus on that. <laughs> and he said, and then we said, well, where should we have it? And then we could tie it to another conference. That makes it economical for people to come. And then, so we said, where's this next? There's an astronomy conference called the DPS meeting, D Division of Planetary Sciences. Where's the next meeting? And they, someone said, Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> good thought. <laughs> I was not living in Hawaii then. So, we all said, ooh, this is the, obviously the choice. <laughs> and, and so it was held in Hawaii, in Kona, in 1984. And, and at that conference, a whole new idea emerged. You were there? Yeah. I, in fact, I was one of the three organizers of the conference. <laughs> okay. um, Linda wasn't born yet. Oh, <laughs> she, was, uh, uh, funny. She, not, she, she was an infant. No <laughs> question about it. Yeah. <laughs> And <laughs> uh, anyway, it, it's um, there was two papers published. Actually, one was an abstract only in 1975, and they just languished. But the idea was the moon formed by a big impact, a real, but with a, like a Mars-sized object. Yeah. And in fact, if you can show number six, oh, this is really getting five? interesting. Oh, wait, oh no, no, wait, show number five. We'll right. go back to this. <laughs> you forget six, yeah. There we go. I, I just wanted to show this. This is that was held at the King Kamehameha Hotel in Kona, downtown yeah. Kona. Yeah. And this is the hallway it was held in. <laughs> I took this picture in April of this year when I went, my daughter was, she's, this is an, an American Youth Soccer Organization meeting. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and it was at the same hotel. It was at the same hotel. So I took a picture of the hallway, and the meeting rooms are off to the left. And I just thought I would show that. Uh, it's kind of an interesting concept, but the place is still going strong. Well, it's a great place for meetings. It's, by the it's way. called B-roll. It's you know it's sort of leading up to the, the big story. Yeah. The, and the story would be when you had the, the conference mm -hmm. and you were there as one of what three, three basic organizers. presenters. Yep. Well, and, organizers. And you found this this uh, you found this theory that yeah. sounds pretty good, but well. but we can't talk about it right now because now we have to take a break. But when we come back, Are you sure. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Be better. Be better after oh, one we'll be minute. Better. Watch yeah. this. Thank you for watching Think Tech. I'm Grace Chang, the new host for Global Connections. You can find me here live every Thursday at 1 p.m. 
where we'll be talking to people around the islands or visiting the islands who are connected in various aspects of global affairs. So please tune in and aloha and thanks for watching. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., you'll have a chance to come and listen and learn from scientists around the world. Scientists who talk about their work in meaningful, easy to understand ways. And you'll come to appreciate science as a wonderful way of thinking, way of knowing about the world. You'll learn interesting facts, interesting ideas. You'll be stimulated to think more. Please come join us every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii for a likable science with me, your host, Ethan Allen. Bingo, we're back. Think Tech on research in Manoa with uh, Jeff Taylor and Linda Martell talking about uh, the origin um, of Earth and the Moon, comma, inseparable. Okay, we got a new theory on the whole thing. Gonna, it's going to happen now. Watch this. Pops out in 1984, and this painting is a very famous painting, number six. This painting is by William K. Hartman, who is the inventor of the whole big impact theory and one of the co-organizers of this conference. The third one was a guy named Roger Phillips, who recently retired from Southwest Research Institute. So Hartman is a painter as well as a scientist, which is a great gift to be able to illustrate your ideas. Yeah, really great. So he and a guy named Don Davis came up with this idea that there's a lot of things, kind of, Jay, like you were talking about before, about these things flying around. They, they like moon-sized objects and even bigger. Well, they thought maybe a Mars-sized object hit the Earth and sent debris into orbit. Sort of dug a, dug a hole and threw sort that piece out. Sort of dig a hole, but it's such a violent event because they're coming in at 15, what's it coming in? Big, bigger than 25,000 miles an hour because that's the Earth's uh, escape velocity. And it's a tremendous amount of energy involved. And so it ends up making kind of a ring around the Earth. And we'll, we'll show a, a, a little movie of that in a bit. But it's, it really is a, a, a profoundly important event and Hartman was able to picture it. So that, that, that uh, sort of goes to the whole thing about gravity drawing um, objects in space into the Earth because it's bigger and it has the and, gravity. And it grows fast, and once it grows fast, but then Jupiter, too, plays a role in all this. Cause Jupiter. It, it changes the orbits of things, and so... Because it's big. Because it's big, and so this object might have come from the vicinity of Mars, even. We don't know this for sure but it, it comes whipping in and it hits the Earth. The question is, did it happen with Venus? Maybe it did, but it hit it head on, so you didn't have the spin to send stuff into orbit and keep it there. But I have a question. Earlier, we, we debunked one of the theories because the moon doesn't have the metallic that Earth has. Ah, uh, yes. We found no metallic on the moon, and therefore there's a real question about whether one it of this, came out of the Pacific uh, basis. One of the selling points of this idea is that the big impactor, that's the size of Mars, it's the tenth of diameter of the Earth. Hartman actually has smaller in his picture, but um, it's already molten and formed a core. And when you do computer simulations of these things, when actually certain people do, the other I people. don't. Certain people. The other, other people. people. <laughs> we have a technical staff that does it. And <laughs> they don't want to be called Very technical staff, I don't think. Anyway, <laughs> it, it, the metal, the big core that is, is way bigger than the moon itself, actually, ends up sinking through the Earth into its core. And the stuff that goes into orbit is from the rocky outsides of the two objects. Okay, and that and would not solved, include metals. And that solves the problem okay. of the metal core, and then okay. it solves the problem, too, of spinning everything up so that you keep things in orbit. And, uh, and so it's, it's kind of a satisfying idea. And everyone at this conference, except for three people, uh, bought into the idea. Two of them, one was a captain guy, one was a fishing guy, and you, get, you, you know those people, you just can't nothing, keep it. Nothing, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> but the, the other guy was a really great lunar scientist, and still is a great lunar scientist, named Paul Warren, he's at UCLA. And he, he uh, on the field, we had a field trip in between this first meeting and the Origin of the Moon meeting uh, to, to Kilauea, and at the, you know, the Volcano Arts Center, 
I'm sure. Hartman had his painting there for sale. <laughs> this guy, Paul Warren, buys the painting. Perfect. And at the end of the conference, he was one of the people who didn't buy into the idea yet. <laughs> he bought the painting, but not the idea. Not the, the idea, <laughs> yeah. Still owns the painting. He wanted to get it off the market. <laughs> <laughs> he still, still owns the painting and has it on display uh, beautifully in his house and taken care of with special lights because he knows it's an it's a important, important thing. Yeah. In his heart, he knows it's Well, right. he actually, he's almost everyone has bought into aspects of this whole thing yeah. now. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's look at the simulation now, okay? And, Oh, you well, one more, one, one more quick point. point. Oh, here it is. Yeah, okay, take there a look. It is. This, okay. this is done by Robin Canup, who's at Southwest Research Institute in Boulder. And there, there are two objects come smashing into each other, and it'll, it'll play okay, again. We just have to have time. It, it'll <laughs> play it again. When the two objects hit, they, there's a color coding there for go. temperature. The, the redder, it's hotter. The, the temperatures of the really hot things get up to 7,000 Kelvin. Oh. And, and, and then you can see all the debris around the moon. The little circles are actually little analytical grid points in the calculations. These are called 3D hydrodynamic codes. Of course they are. <laughs> At dinner, my That's wife what and I, I call speak of little oh. else. <laughs> uh, really, you can't. I don't go a day, do I, without saying 3D hydrodynamic <laughs> code. Now I. Uh, <laughs> So th those codes are driven by though, the real chemical evidence that we have from the rocks that the Apollo astronauts they, brought back and the uh, isotopes. And one of the interesting so things is about... This is not in a vacuum, so to speak. No. No, they're being... And, and computer power. Mm -hmm. The beauty of this 1984 conference is that computers had become cheaper. And so you could have a little laboratory computer and run simulations. They were simpler than they are now. Mm -hmm. But that came along and our knowledge of the impact process came along. Uh -huh. So these two things could be combined, and, and now all those things are much better than, than anything else, and just as our chemical analyses are better than they were then. Yes. So it really is great. And an interesting thing about the, one of the interesting things about the big impact idea is that it actually ties elements of all the other ideas together. Yes. And so the, the slide seven shows this. Remember okay. those other pictures we showed? They're, they have those names, fission, capture, and co-accretion growing together. And, and where they all intersect in ideas is that big impact theory now. We call it the giant impact theory um, hypothesis. So we're still working on that. That's what all of the effort is. But it has, is has some aspects. You know, the of impact each. chips things off, doesn't quite chip it off. It's not the right thing because it melts so much of it and vaporizes even. I mean, this, yeah. after this, this cloud contains rock vapor. I mean, this is so hot. Rock vapor. <laughs> yeah. Wow. wow. But it's so, and it goes around. So then it becomes the cloud of stuff like accreting the, around the Earth, just like the co-accretion. Yeah. But it captured it too because some of the material is coming from the big impactor, and it does kind of fission off a lot of material from the Earth. So it has elements of all, all of it. All of the ideas. So it's like the Henry Clay great compromiser theory of. Uh, of the origin of the yeah. moon, you know, it blends everything together. Can we look at that one more time? Just want to. Uh, the Robin. Okay, so oh. I understand the capture because the capture assumes that it's coming from space somewhere, mm -hmm. and the modification is instead of going around the, the Earth, it hits the Earth. I understand co-accretion because, well, I'm not sure I understand the, the, the uh, implications of co-accretion co and big impact. And with fission, I don't understand that because because fission assumes that it came from the Earth. It, well, it did. It come, does. Yes, it did. Yes. It isn't all of it. It's some of some it, of and it. the okay. two things oh, may wow. merge. And there is isotopic evidence that suggests that they merge completely. I mean, they they got homogenized. The whatever the composition of the big impactor and the, came the Earth came sort of like that. Yeah. 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 What yeah, about so the co-accretion one? The co-accretion is, once you do this, and you remember at the end of the simulation, which we should show again because it's so cool. Um, <laughs> that's from the internet. You hear about that? You hear about I've that heard internet? of it, yeah. yeah. I know and, I've um, <laughs> but once, at the end of it, you see this disk of stuff around it. Well, the moon forms in that. So in that sense, it's at that stage, it's co-accreting. The Earth is already formed. So that's a different, but it accretes around the Earth. So what is this, you know, this theory? Oh, here it is uh, uh, Oh, there it is. <laughs> okay. 
So this is what happened when... If that, something hit the... Something, something hit the earth. earth. And they do many, there's a lot of variables, the size of the object, the velocity of the object, and the angle with respect but to the... It should be consistent with geophysics, geophysical yes. principles. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a, it really is an interesting thing. Well, yeah, that, I wanted to explore that. So here we are, and we've we found a theory that works, that adopts uh, accidentally or on purpose, uh, you know, all the theory, all the three theories from before. Um, and now we have a better guess as to what happened and how the moon, okay. <clears throat> but what does this teach us in a larger sense? What have we learned here that, you know, that would be useful in space travel, that be useful in understanding, you know, the, the formation of other moons and places. Around um, other suns. Around other suns. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it sounds like it would be, it, it's, it's a breakthrough of sorts, but, but what is it? Conceptually, I, I think one of the most interesting things is that it tells us planets, there was a theory at first, and then becomes a little more advanced, or a hypothesis at first, you know, you're making a, a guess and then it becomes firmer and firmer, that the planets, the inner planets, did form by little things coming together. It started with dust that became asteroid sized, and the asteroids became moon to Mars sized, and these things all kept whacking into each other until they were either ejected from the solar system by making a close pass to the sun or something, or made a bigger planet. Yeah. And there is hints that this is going on when we look at stars, other stars, and other... Uh, the astronomers are looking for this kind of situation. Around other stars, are there Earth-like planets with moons similar to ours, well, like a system ours. like ours? And we but it could happen again. Now, maybe not here. Not here. We're an older solar system, am I yeah. right about that? Um, but it could happen somewhere else, and we oh. could actually... We, in principle, we may have, we had a PSRD article that was written by one of our graduate students with a faculty member who is in, could have been in the Institute for Astronomy, but he's in geology and geophysics, one of these broad multidisciplinary close, people by yeah. Eric Guidos, his name is, I don't know if you've ever met him. But, and David Trang was the student. There was, it was part of a course project, and. Uh, there was a signal in the infrared around one of these very young stars that you can interpret as a big collision. A, a so, collision like this would happen instantaneously or, it's or what, a slow motion? When, um, the event that ends up making the first ring around the Earth, you know, where there's a lot of debris and it's hot, is a week. A week. A week. And We're then about big numbers the moon here. would form, half the moon could form, these are simulations done by Robin Canop, who showed the one, uh, who made the one that we showed, yeah. that um, it's a week to make half the moon and then a couple hundred years to finish the job. You know, this is instantaneous. I mean, a, a when we're talking time about billions of yeah. years. Yeah, well, yeah. in the Bible, they talk about what, how, how it took uh, <laughs> uh, so many days. Yeah. to do this and that, so this, maybe there's something we can learn. In the <laughs> you, you guys are great. This is <laughs> terrific. This is a great examination. So it, it puts us there. It puts us there in space watching these things happen. So yeah, thank you thank very you. much. Oh. Linda, you're great. It's been great. Linda Martell, <laughs> Jeff Taylor, you guys are fabulous. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Jay. Thank you so much. As always, come back soon. <laughs>